somewhere in England, sometime between 1860 and 1863, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints first sang, We Thank Thee, O God, for a Prophet. The author was the convert William Fowler, a man who had been left an orphan at the age of 15. After serving as a missionary in England, Brother Fowler immigrated to Utah and settled in Manti. George D. Piper, the first to chronicle the stories of our hymns, said, It cannot be called the greatest hymn written by any of our authors, but it has something different from our other hymns. It is exclusively a Latter-day Saint hymn, a Mormon heartthrob, a song of the Restoration. When we hear this hymn, we thank the O God for a prophet, Many of us see the hands of the saints around the world clasping white handkerchiefs as they wave their love and gratitude to our dear prophet. And when we sing this hymn, we are reminded of the joyous message of the restoration of the gospel in these latter days. It is an anthem of faith and an anthem of hope. Brother Fowler wrote in the second verse, when dark clouds of trouble hang o'er us and threaten our peace to destroy, there is hope smiling brightly before us, and we know that deliverance is nigh. In the same stanza, he explains why we can sing such words of faith and hope. He wrote, We doubt not the Lord nor his goodness. We've proved him in days that are past. For years, I thought that faith and hope were almost like a train. I saw faith as the little engine that could, chugging mightily along with hope trailing behind like a tiny caboose, always following faith and being quite distinct from faith. Now I have been taught that I was wrong. Elder Maxwell said, hope has a greater circumference than faith. If faith increases, the perimeter of hope stretches correspondingly. I have seen this ever-increasing hope in the lives of our brothers and sisters who doubt not the Lord nor his goodness. I have been blessed to be alive as the kingdom of God rolls forth to fill the earth. I have had the blessing to live among the saints in many parts of the world and have come to know them and the hopeful patterns of their lives. I have seen saints in the Philippines fast for two days in order to have the money to buy bus fare to attend the first area conference in that country. I have seen faithful members of the church in Africa pay an honest tithing even when they knew they did not know when their next meal would come. And I have seen faithful members of the church in Arizona lose loved ones and stand in funeral lines with faith and hope, comforting those who came to offer comfort to them. I have felt so blessed to be here as the sesquicentennial was celebrated and our pioneers were honored. And I've been blessed to have good people in my ward and in my neighborhood and in my work. And I have learned from them as they face life's tests, doubts, fears, hurts, and disappointments. Through these experiences, I have come to know that faith and hope are not like an engine and caboose at all. Instead, they are more like two pedals on a bicycle, working in tandem to move us forward toward salvation and eternal life. Think about these scriptures for a moment. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, we read that faith is the assurance of things hoped for. In Alma, chapter 32, verse 21, we learn that if ye have faith, ye hope for things which are not seen, which are true. And Paul taught in Romans, chapter 8, verse 24, that we are saved by hope. We know that the first principle of the gospel is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Not faith alone, but faith in the one true Savior. 
faith in the only name that offers safety and salvation. Is it any wonder then that hope is tied to this same principle and to this same Savior? Mormon taught, how is it that ye can attain unto faith, save ye shall have hope? And what is it that ye shall hope for? Behold, I say unto you that ye shall have hope through the atonement of Christ and the power of his resurrection to be raised unto life eternal, and this because of your faith in him according to the promise. Wherefore, if a man have faith, he must needs have hope. For without faith, there cannot be any hope. Christ lives. He is risen. He is the Savior. His truth and authority are again on earth. This is the magnificent message of the Restoration. It is the light that came in a quiet grove of trees in Palmyra, New York, and cast out the swirling darkness threatening to envelop a young boy, soon to be a prophet. It is the light that beckoned our ancestors, one of a country and two of a city, to leave all they had and come to Zion. It is the light that shineth in the darkness today and leads the weary and the troubled to the safe harbor of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the light that testifies of him whom we love and delight to serve. Sisters, we have embraced a gospel of hope. How I pray that we now can live that gospel of hope. Sister Duan Young once said that like the Jaredites, we are afraid of traveling in the darkness and we need light, which is hope. Sometimes in the midst of our problems, we lose the vision of why we're here or where we're going. We wonder if we're equal to the tasks that are given us. It is then that we can ask the Lord to touch the unlighted stones of our lives with light. He can deliver peace and hope when all around us speak against it. It is ironic that our word hope has in common usage become a synonym for wishing. We say such things as, I hope my house is still clean when I get home from women's conference. <laughs> or. I hope the taco salad line isn't as long tomorrow as it was today. Or one of my favorites, I hope some strong righteous brother will recognize what a wonderful wife I would be someday. <laughs> These hopes are based in transient, temporary, and feeble things. I doubt we could call them perfect brightness hopes. None of us would stake our eternity on any of them. They are not the source of peace of mind or of self-worth or deep conviction. There is a difference between transitory hope and eternal hope. Elder Maxwell taught that worldly hope is not always focused on justified objects. Christ-centered hope, however, is a very specific and particularized hope. It is focused on the great realities of the resurrection, eternal life, a better world, and Christ's triumphant second coming, things as they really will be." Close quote. Worldly hope is feeble and placed in our own strength, the fashion of the times, or the actions and decisions of others. Christ-centered hope is everlasting because he is everlasting. Worldly hope sees only today or maybe tomorrow while Christ-centered hope has the perspective of eternity. The story of Elisha the prophet is an illustration. In 2 Kings chapter 6, we find Syria at war with Israel, but it seems that the Israelite army is always one step ahead of every move the Syrian army makes. The king of Syria is sure that he has a spy in his own camp and demands that the spy be found. His generals tell him that there is no spy, but the Israelites do have a secret weapon. They have a prophet who tells them what the Syrian army is going to do. The king of Syria commands his troops to find this prophet. 
Elisha's servant awakens one morning to see the mighty horses and chariots of the army of Syria bearing down on the home of Elisha. His plea is quite poignant, and he cries, Alas, my master, how shall we do? Elisha responds quite calmly to his servant. He answers him, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. I'm sure the servant, like us at times, was perplexed and fearful, convinced in the face of the mighty Syrian army that Elisha must really be crazy. Then Elisha prayed, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. You see, Elisha had eternal hope and faith, and he wanted the Lord to bless his servant with the same vision. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Needless to say, the Syrian army was not successful in capturing Elisha. In fact, he captured them led them away, fed them, and then sent them back to their king. How often, in a moment of panic, a moment of fear, a moment of self-doubt, a moment of indecision, a moment of pain, have we been struck with spiritual myopia? Seeing only the temporal here and now, we cry out, as did Elisha's servant, Alas, how shall we do? And yet, if we will but allow the healing, strengthening power of hope in Jesus Christ to wash over us, nurturing us, at it, nurturing it at every opportunity, and humbly opening our eyes that we may see, we too may have the peace and comfort of knowing that they that be with us are more than they that be with them. We can be assured that all these things shall give us experience and shall be for our good, and that we should fear not what man can do, for God shall be with us forever and ever. We nurture this Christ-centered hope when we invite him into our lives, when we learn of him and seek him and earnestly try to follow his teachings. We feed this hope as we serve in callings, large or small, as we attend the temple, as we participate in service projects, as we generously pay our tithes and offerings. We build this hope when we choose to see the good in others and as we do our visiting teaching. This is the kind of hope that is our lighthouse in the storms of life. This is the hope smiling brightly before us that motivates us to find the power to obey. This is the hope that is an incentive and a comfort when repentance is necessary, especially when the changes required are not easy to make. And this is the hope that fosters the humility to resolve to forgive even when the hurts have been deep and painful. This is Christ-centered hope. It is the hope that gives vision and directions to our lives. It is the hope that sustains confidence in the Lord's promises to us. It is the hope that keeps us true to sacred covenants. And it is the hope that fuels our pressing forward with steadfast faith in Christ, overcoming discouragement and temptation with every faithful footstep. Elder Maxwell has said, real hope does not automatically spring eternal unless it is connected with eternal things. Having ultimate hope does not mean we will always be rescued from proximate problems, but we will be rescued from everlasting death. The triad of faith, hope, and charity which brings us to Christ has strong and converging linkage. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hope is in his atonement, and charity is the pure love of Christ. Life hands out disappointments. Things don't always turn out as we planned. We make mistakes, and we suffer from the mistakes of others. We lose loved ones. We never marry. 
we never have children, or the children we have go astray. We struggle financially. It's normal to feel sorrow, grief, and sadness. But our Christ-centered hope will temper that grief and sorrow. If you have seen Anne of Green Gables, you might recall the melodramatic Anne Shirley wailing, I am in the depths of despair. Oh, Marilla, haven't you ever been in the depths of despair? Marilla's response was, no, I have not. To despair is to turn your back on God. Marilla was right. In a time of grief or sorrow or hurt, to turn away from God is the worst possible choice. Marilla would have agreed with Elder Maxwell when he said, just as doubt, despair, and desensitization go together, so do faith, hope, and charity. The latter, however, must be carefully and constantly nurtured, whereas despair, like dandelions, needs so little encouragement to sprout and spread. The amazing thing about hope is that it attracts so many other wonderful attributes. Look at the lives of the men and women you admire. As I read the scriptures, interact with others, listen to the prophet, and try to work out my salvation, I am learning that out of hope comes courage, forgiveness, repentance, patience, and charity, all the attributes of godliness. We actually come to believe the Savior when he promised that his burden would be light. It seems that out of our hope, we fashion our gift to God, and in so doing, we become more like him. Let me share with you the example of a wonderful woman in Africa. Elizabeth is not a member of the church, but she is a true disciple. While I lived in Nigeria, I was able to observe her faithful hope and hopeful faith. Not far from her home in Nigeria was a hospital devoted to the treatment of leprosy. After the patients had been treated for this terrible disease and were no longer a danger to anyone, they were released from the hospital. Unfortunately, though no longer infectious at all, they bore the very visible marks of their disease. They had lost fingers, toes, feet, hands, ears, noses, or even cheeks. These poor people were shunned by everyone. No one would employ them. In fact, they could not even shop in the market because no one would accept their money. A group of Catholic fathers purchased a small farm and allowed these recovered patients and their families to live and work on the farm. My friend, a good Catholic woman, knew of their meager condition and made them one of, one of her many personal crusades. She worked tirelessly to find donated furniture, cooking utensils, clothing, and other necessities for these outcasts. And once a month, she cooked an elaborate dinner and took it to the farm. I was privileged to go with her on one of her dinner trips. I asked her why she chose to cook such a fancy dinner that involved so much preparation in the kitchen. Her explanation humbled me immediately. Sandra, she said, imagine that you are a woman who has lost many of her fingers and her thumbs from leprosy. Imagine how much work it is to even hold a spoon to stir a simple pot of soup. Imagine how plain and monotonous your diet would be. Now can you imagine why I have decided to make these dinners? Yes, I, I could imagine. I have never had such an experience in my life. As my dear friend and mentor drove into the farmyard, she was immediately encircled by people delighted to see her. Despite my time in nursing, I had never seen the ravages of leprosy before. I had not seen the missing digits, the crude amputations, the rough prostheses, the missing noses or ears, or the facial deformities. I watched my friend 
gather them all in her embrace, greeting them with love and affection. And with such a sweet example, I could only follow her lead. How loving these people were, how gracious and grateful they were. We had a wonderful time, and at the end of our afternoon together, they sang a special song asking God to protect the white woman as she returned to her people far away. My friend Elizabeth was not wealthy. My friend Elizabeth was struggling in a, a terrible economic situation in Nigeria. My friend Elizabeth had lost her own son in a tragic accident. But my friend Elizabeth was also filling her life with the fruits of faith, hope, and charity as she kept the two great commandments. She taught me something else, Elder Maxwell said, that real hope is much more than wishful musing. It stiffens, not slackens, the spiritual spine. Hope is realistic anticipation taking the form of determination. Elizabeth never mused about what might happen to these shunned people. She was simply determined to do, as she explained to me, what any good Christian would do. Now I ask myself, what lessons are there in this for me? I do not face persecution for my religious beliefs. I do not face economic hardship. I do not face a disfiguring disease. But I do face other tests in mortality. And I have come to learn that every decision I make is a demonstration of faithful hope and hopeful faith. Out of our faith and hope in Christ and his atonement come the thoughts, the actions, and the choices that lead us closer to his light. I have learned that hope is not about what is happening to me, but it is very much about how I respond to what is happening. Every good person I know demonstrates that hope is connected to good cheer and the determination to do good and be good no matter the risk or the cost. Hoping to endure to the end is not akin to taking a few aspirin to dull a migraine. No, it's more like the Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whose faithful hope took them through the fiery furnace without even the smell of smoke remaining on their clothing. Several years ago, during the sesquicentennial, for a variety of reasons, I was for feeling particularly unsuccessful at dealing with certain challenges. The more I thought about the faith, courage, and sacrifices of my ancestors, the more I wondered if I was the weak branch in my family tree. Then I thought I had the answer. I knew the answer. I had been born a century too late. I'm a big husky girl, I thought. I should have been asked to pull a handcart. I began to think that I could have handled a handcart far better than I was handling whatever I was facing at the time. Now let me just admit right now that after visiting Martin's Cove and driving near the area of Rocky Ridge last year, I was probably wrong about my ability to pull a handcart. <laughs> Nevertheless, at the time, I saw myself better fitted for that test. Then one night, I saw myself in a dream. I was dressed in pioneer costume and I was standing between the handlebars of a handcart. In that brief moment, I had the sense of looking and reaching toward Zion that motivated my ancestors. I felt my soul fill with their faith and hope. I turned to look at the back of the handcart, expecting to see bedding, food, cooking utensils, or other necessities for the trek. Instead, symbolically, I saw the things I had been struggling with. I then had the impression of a voice saying to me, Sandra, you were right when you said you could pull a handcart. This is your handcart, and it's time for you to start pulling it. Now, dear sisters, I have no idea what is in your handcart. 
I'm sure if I gave you a few moments, you could list the many things you are trying to pull along. But what I do know is that as we cultivate hope and faith, we will be sustained by the Lord in pulling that handcart, just as our ancestors were sustained in pulling theirs. We can seek Jesus in the scriptures, at the temple, in sacrament meeting, or in conference, through prayer and through service. We can learn of him and his ways. There are times when I am uncertain about things in my family or in the world or things at work and sometimes even uncertain about myself. But I am never uncertain about the atonement of Jesus Christ, the plan of salvation or the restoration of the gospel. We can have great hope that Christ lives and will come again and that our faith in him is not in vain. We can have great hope that righteous living helps us overcome discouragement. And through our Christ-centered hope, we can bear record of him with joy and rejoicing. Let us often join with William Fowler, the British convert, and sing of his goodness and mercy. Let's praise him by day and by night. Rejoice in his glorious gospel and bask in its life-giving light. May this hope be constantly smiling before us is my prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.